on your video, feel free because um, when I'm on a Zoom call, I tend to have the screen on where I can see everyone's faces. There's so many people on this call, I won't be able to see you all, but um, I've taught so many classes over the years that looking at a Zoom screen just of black little boxes with names is very disconcerting to me. <laughs> so um, don't feel, feel welcome to put your video on if that's okay with Kara. Um, the first thing I will say is um, if, if you remember to pick up your little cheese tray, it looks like this. I still have the plastic on mine. If you haven't unwrapped it, go ahead and unwrap it. Hopefully you haven't eaten it. If you've eaten it, uh, you'll get to hear about what you ate. But <laughs> if you haven't eaten it, we'll be tasting it together. Um, and it'll be just a few minutes before we actually try the cheeses. So um, it, it'll be nice for them to warm up a little bit. And um, so I should, Full disclosure, um, I'm Jeannie Carpenter, owner of Firefly. My husband is here sitting right there. You can't see him, um, but he's my tech guy. Oh, there's his hand. And hey, you wanna unwrap this for me? <laughs> he, um, we're gonna have um, just like a few photos and a quick video to show you tonight. Um, because this, the talk that I'm doing tonight is uh, I've called the evolution of cheddar. Um, a little bit about me, uh, Uriah and I are in our fourth year of owning the Firefly. Uh, for the 15 years before that, I worked um, in the Wisconsin artisan and specialty cheese industry. Um, so I worked in that industry before there was an industry. In 2003, I got hired by the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture to um, be part of a four-person team where we traveled every cheese factory in the state of Wisconsin and about half the dairy farms. And we encouraged um, cheesemakers to transition to from making commodity, low-profit cheese to um, higher profit specialty cheeses. And that was a 15 year journey for me. Um, and so I've been in almost, I would say probably every cheese factory in the state. Um, uh, in that time, um, we helped about, I think, I think it was 17 dairy farmers start, on, start their own on-farm dairy plants. So like Sassy Cow Creamery is a great example. Um, I was one of the consultants that helped them figure out the business plan for that. Um, and what that has done for Sassy Cow Creamery, it's taken their milk off of that federal milk marketing order program where you never know how much you're gonna get paid for your milk from week to week to they now control the price of their milk and they sell it themselves. Um, and it's, I don't wanna say they're always profitable but at least they know how much money they're going to make. And I grew up on a farm. And so even, even if when you're a farmer and you know how much money you're gonna make, it it just alleviates so much stress or how much money you're gonna lose. <laughs> just the not knowing I find is the, the stress killer for farmers. So um, so that that's my background. I, I bought, I sold, I marketed, I educated about Wisconsin specialty arts and cheeses for 15 years. Um, this is why we are a coffee shop that has a cheese case in our coffee shop. Um, I carry cheeses that I still have really good relationships with the cheesemakers. Um, the cheeses that we have tonight um, are both from Hooks. I'm a huge fan of Hooks cheeses. Uh, they just, they do so much for the community. They're the nicest people. Before COVID, you may have met them or talked with them at the Dane County Farmer's Market. They're on, on they used to be on the square every Saturday. Um, and they're just, they're just good people. So um, I will... So I will say that um, I've been teaching classes at the Firefly for about 13 years. Um, and then I've taught classes all over the country. And um, tonight's cheese plate is like super duper simple. Like you didn't even get instructions for it because there's literally two pieces of cheese and three crackers. So, um, and that's just because this is a very simple tasting and talk tonight. If you're ever interested in doing another class with me, we I tend to do elaborate cheese plates and more elaborate um, I like to I like to deep dive into topics. I'm kind of my license plate says cheese geek, so I'm very much into the art and the science. Um, and also, but also if you're not into the art and science, you still get a plate of cheese to eat. <laughs> so it seems to be a win-win for for people who who come to the classes. Um, so so you have this you have this cheese plate right, and um, I should say you may have figured this out by now that the the long strip is the hooks one ear. And then the, the more rectangular piece of cheese, which is um, not bright orange, is got, I mean, it's discolored. The, this piece of cheese is 20 years old. Um, that's your 20 year cheddar. 
And so I would encourage you, if you can, to wait until we kind of get to the guided tasting. The crackers are here just because this little plate with two pieces of cheese was so sad. I needed to put something in between. Um, but you could also use these crackers as a palate cleanser between the two cheeses. Um, these are just, um, they're gluten-free six seed rice crackers. They're, I get them from Costco. I'm kind of addicted to them. Um, and they go, they go with lots of cheese and they're gluten-free. So it's, they're very friendly. So that's your plate. So if you haven't unwrapped your plate yet, do that. Let your cheese breathe. Um, and then we'll get started if everybody's ready. Um, and then I see there's some questions on the, in the thing that how do you get info on those classes? They don't exist yet. <laughs> My, uh, we, if, you, if you haven't been to the Firefly lately, you um, will notice that we are in the middle of a very large remodeling project. We are completely um, rebuilding our kitchen to uh, better, faster serve food. Um, and so uh, Uri has assured me, he's sitting here, that this kitchen remodel project will be done like hopefully within a couple weeks, right, honey? Isn't it done now? Oh, he says, isn't it done now? <laughs> um, so after my kitchen is back um, in place, I will start focusing more on cheese classes. So thank you on that. Um, so, so let's start. So. I have a few notes here that I'll put up here and I'll kind of refer to them. Maybe I'll put them on the side so I can still see the chat. Um, so one of the things that I learned when I started um, in, based, so I, I should say that I fell, I fell into the cheese industry. I got, hired, I got hired at the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture to run the Allison Dairyland program. Who, who here knows the Allison Dairyland program? It's a great program, yes. A new Alice is, is selected every year. Um, I never got to actually run that program because I think 90 days after I was hired to run it, we ended up getting federal funding um, through Senator Herb Cole um, with the mantra to save the Wisconsin dairy industry. And so I was one of four people selected because my background is in journalism. Um, uh, I was a, a city county government police fire courts reporter for nine years out of college. So I like to write, I like to tell people stories. And so I was the communications piece I was the person that they would send into the cheese factory with the two technical guys to put the nice face on the state of Wisconsin. Like we're from the state of Wisconsin and we're here to help you. And these two guys are really not that friendly. So let me, let me make you feel welcome that we're not here to inspect you, we're here to help you. So that was how um, I got started. And one of the things that I found out very quickly is that there, there is no other cheese in the state of Wisconsin that better defines the state than cheddar. Um, in, in the early 2000s, the late 90s, uh, there, there were about 150 cheese factories. And it's not an exaggeration to say almost all of them were making cheddar. They were all making either 40 pound block or 640 pound block commodity cheddar and then selling it to two or three um, major buyers. And they were all competing against each other and they were all competing for pennies on the pound. Um, if you've ever heard me talk about Raleigh cheese and uh, master cheesemaker Chris Raleigh, he, he revived the company business after his father got out of it in the 80s because his father was tired of making two cents a pound on cheddar. That was literally where the cheese industry was in, in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, I was on a team to help create was to, to get cheesemakers to realize the value of what they had, to, to, to realize the value of these, this cheese that mostly at that time was still being hand cheddared, and we'll talk about that. And instead of putting it in these huge blocks or these huge um, these rectangles that would like fill a table, to instead start, start putting in hoops, in wheels, and more importantly, to start aging it. And even more importantly, to start putting their label on it. Um, Hook's, Hook's cheese has existed since 1976. It's only existed with Tony Hook's label on it since 1991. Before that, he made commodity cheddar and sold it to the big buyers. And it was happy when he made seven cents a pound. Um, so Tony was kind of this leader in the, in the state with um, realizing earlier than most the value that he had in his name and the value that he had in his product because he makes really, really good cheddar. So still today, 
Um, we're down to we're down to 127 cheese factories, which by the way is the most of any state in America. Um, and now we're down to about um, 62, 63 of them craft cheddar. So to me, that's a success story because that means the other half are creating specialty cheeses. Um, that's why we still have 127 cheeses. And of those guys, and they're mostly all guys, um, still creating cheddar, about half of those guys are in the exclusive specialty cheddar market. Um, and Tony Hook is in the specialty cheddar market. Tony Hook is no longer selling any commodity cheddar to aging warehouses. Um, he is selling it all under his name and aging it out. Um, the Hooks are only the also the only company um, in Wisconsin and really one of the only in the United States that produce 40 pound blocks of cheddar with the sole purpose of aging it for up to 20 years. So Tony Hook would tell you that his goal in every vat of cheese is to age it out to 20 years. Now, does that happen? No, he's only made it to 20 years twice in his career. And the second time was released in 2020, which is the cheese that you're tasting tonight. Um, literally all the stars have to align for a cheddar to be able to get out to 20 years. And I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, um, so yeah, so in 2020 for only the second time in his 25 cheese making year career, um, Tony released this, this batch of 20 year cheddar. He sold it at $209 a pound. Um, most retailers sold it for $229 a pound. There was um, a little over 500 pounds available and um, I, at the time, I could afford to buy five pounds. <laughs> so, which was a th like a thousand bucks, right? Um, when I worked at Mac, I was a specialty cheese buyer for Metcalf's Markets for five years. In 2015, when he released 500 pounds of uh, 20 year cheddar, um, I bought 60 pounds of it for Metcalf's and we pre-sold it all. Um, so I gotta say my, my ego took a little bit of a hit with Tony. I was like, well, I bought 60 last time and now I'm buying one, um, but it's, it's still fun to eat. So, so just like to, to kind of like compare or to realize this, this little rectangle of 20 year cheddar on your plate um, costs $11. <laughs> you, have, you have an $11 piece of cheese on your plate versus the one year strip of the, like that bright fluorescent orange uh, that cost me a quarter. So um, you learn, pre it's pretty quickly to do that math, right? You understand why cheese makers try to get these cheeses to age out because it's, it's much more profitable um, to sell cheese when it's aged. Um, and I should say that one of the reasons I decided to do this class for free, why everybody has an $11 piece of cheese in, in front of them, is because both times that the Hooks have released their 20-year cheddar, they have donated half of all the sales to the Center for Dairy Research at UW-Madison to help fu future cheesemakers get started and to help the scientists there um, help cheesemakers make better cheese. Um, so um, I'm, I, I think that's just amazing that that he's done that. Um, plus we're in the middle of a pandemic. So, and it's winter and we had the snowmageddon today. So why, why not uh, uh, kind of break up things and, and share the wealth? So um, one of the things I'm going to start with is I'm gonna talk about the, um, um, how, explain how cheddar is made. And then we're gonna talk about um, why different ages carry different profiles. We'll get into a little bit of the science. This is not gonna be a super science geeky class, but I can't talk about cheddar without talking about acid. Um, so we'll, we'll do that just a little bit. And then I'm also gonna geek out just for a few minutes and talk about why cheddar made in different parts of the state taste differently. And I'll give you just um, kind of a, 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 a glimpse that it has to do with dirt. Um, I've written entire papers on this. So that's how exciting I find it, but I find that other people don't. So very, very little bit on, on dirt tonight. Um, so first we're gonna start here. Your eye is gonna be um, my techno wizard. We, um, hang on, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> so um, about five, I don't know how many years ago we did this. Um, 
So before, and I should say, in addition to doing my consulting work with the Department of Agriculture, I also had my own company called Wisconsin Cheese Originals. Um, you may have gone to a cheese festival. I used to do a three-year or three-day cheese festival every year at the Minota Terrace. Um, I did Cheese Topia in Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis. We did Cheese Camp at the Edgewater. Um, we did all these events where we brought cheesemakers to the masses, right? So you got to, you got to, the whole point was to shake the cheesemaker's hand while you ate their cheese. That was my entire goal in life, like meet the person who makes your food. And so um, one of the things that we used to do every year is we used to take a very small group of people to Raleigh Cheese in uh, between Darlington and Schulzburg. It's called um, Hook's Corners. Um, and we used to have a cheddar making day where people would actually get to make cheese with Chris Raleigh. We can't do stuff like that anymore. The Food Safety Modernization Act, which was passed four or five years ago, put an end to any person being on a cheese make floor that who isn't the cheese maker. Um, so even me, the last time I was in a cheese plant was a couple years ago. I went down to Montchev in Belmont um, for a day to write some things on what they were doing. And they put me in a full hazmat suit with like, I looked like a beekeeper. Um, and I had to sign multiple documents saying I was making cheese that day. So I was allowed in the make room. It's a lot different than it used to be four or five years ago. But anyway, so your eye put together this video, um, uh, the song that accompanies it, make sure you turn on your sound. I mean, your sound is already on, but um, the song that accompanies it is a little play on words. So you have to see if you, if you get it. Um, and it's like two minutes. It describes how cheddar is made. Okay, Uriah. So I will let you do that. Oh, it's, it, I'm sorry. It's like the, it's uh, how a cheese curd is made, which is the, the preface of um, cheddar. All right, here we go. My mama told me when I was young, we're all on superstars. Did everybody get the, the double meaning of the song, Born This Way, W-H-E-Y? Yes, now you understand why I'm weird. <laughs> um, so stuff like that is stuff like is fun stuff that Uriah used to help, help me do um, just to show people that how cheddar is made. So what you saw in that like 90 second, two minute video is um, between a five and a six hour process. Um, Cheese making is not a quick, a quick process. Um, uh, and making cheddar the traditional way is particu takes particularly um, a long time. Um, so 
so basically what you just saw in those two minutes was um, heating the milk, adding the starter culture, then you're adding the rennet and the annatto. The annatto, by the way, is what makes um, cheddar orange. Annatto is a seed from a plant that is native to South America. It's an all natural product. Um, it has no taste. So it just adds that orange color and that is very much a cultural aspect of Wisconsin cheddar. Um, traditionally, we've, we've colored our, our cheddar orange. Um, and then um, you're, you saw I'm cutting the curd with the knife. Um, and then in between the cutting and, um, and the stirring, you're letting the curd heal for a few minutes. And then you're stirring again. You're then draining the whey. Um, and then the, then the cheddaring process starts. So that whole process we saw of pushing the curd to one end of the vat, cutting it down the middle, cutting it with that giant knife, and then flipping the slabs. Um, the reason that they're flipping those slabs of cheddar is that they're naturally pushing the whey out of the cheese. Um, so that is, that is the way that um, traditional cheddar is made. Um, by the way, cheddar um, got its name from the Cheddar Gorge in England. Um, interestingly enough, in the UK, there's only six uh, cheddar makers left. Uh, uh, and this is a whole other class I could do, but England lost most of their cheese making um, industry in World War II. And so there's very few cheesemakers left in the UK um, and only six um, men and women making cheddar. Um, so why I talk about that hand cheddaring process and why that makes cheddar special is that um, where like 30 years ago, especially 50 years ago, definitely a hundred years ago, all cheddar was made that way. It was called hand cheddar. Um, it is super labor intensive. Um, Uri, do you want to bring up the, the couple photos of, of Tony Hook? Um, um, I've made uh, cheese with Tony Hook several times. And so I, I just got a few photos up here to show you. So this is, this is Tony Hook. This is the man of the hour whose cheese we are tasting. This is a cheese, a cheese knife. He is cutting um, that coagulated curd um, that process is kind of like gelatin. He's cutting it into, into curds. Um, this is uh, milling the curds. But before that, this, the reason I have this photo is this is why very few cheesemakers hand cheddar curd anymore. Because let's look at Tony's posture. Do you think this is good for Tony's back? This is not good for Tony's back. Also, cheese is really heavy. Um, I have done the cheddaring process. I think three or four cheesemakers have let me do it. And all of them have stood back and laughed while I am trying to pick up and maneuver this giant slippery piece mold of cheddar that is really heavy, really slippery. And these guys make it look super easy. Um, and this is just one vat of cheddar. So if, you, if you're a cheesemaker, you're making multiple vats of cheddar a day you're doing this process multiple times a day. So you see um, cheesemakers with bad knees, with bad backs, they have, they have, they have um, rotator cuff surgery. That's very common. Um, and that's one of the reasons that you're not seeing a lot of cheesemakers do this hand cheddaring. Um, Tony Hook runs a pretty simple, um, this is the last photo I'll show you, a pretty simple um, operation. This is a panoramic view, so it makes it look like it's about nine times bigger than it is, but it all fits in like the size probably of most of your dining rooms. Um, this is his retail store. He has that one um, that one cooler to the right. Um, you know, he's got equipment in this area. He's got a bunch of his awards. All those are really old, by the way. They're framed. They're faded. He's given up putting all his awards up because there's so many. Um, but he's still doing things the, the old fashioned way. All right, so you're I do like get me out of that. So the reason that I mentioned that is that most, so there's about 560 million pounds of cheddar being made in Wisconsin right now, 560 million pounds. Most of that, the vast majority, like nine, more than 90% is being made in what's called cheddar towers. So um, if you ever get a chance to, some of these places have viewing areas, but most don't because they don't want to see you to see that they're pushing buttons and a, a 40 pound block of cheddar is being made in about two and a half hours. 
Cheddar Towers are making a product that is never meant to be aged. It's made to be in a 40 pound block. It's meant to be cut up and wrapped and sold as like Crystal Cheddar, uh, Crystal Farms Mild Cheddar. Um, the industry has no specific term, no specific definitions for the term sharp. Um, so the, the understood meaning of sharp in, for Wisconsin and all US cheesemakers is a cheddar that is six months old. <laughs> Cracks me up. So if you, if you buy a sharp cheddar, like it's a craft sharp cheddar, it's six months old. Um, Tony Hook does not even sell cheddar that's under a year old. So um, at, here at the Firefly, um, I buy between 40 and 60 pounds of Hook's one ear cheddar a week. It's our house cheddar. We, I buy in five pound loaves and we are using, we go, I buy like the nicest, most German heavy duty cheese slicers I can buy. And we're still going through one about every two weeks. Uriah is always replacing wires for me. Um, but it's, it's just really good cheese. His one ear cheddar is so good. Um, and so that's why I wanna talk, talk a little bit about the cheddaring process because very few um, cheddar makers are still doing that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before we actually eat cheese, because I've learned never to talk too long, and I've probably talked too long before we're eating cheese, is um, that if you, a fun thing for me to do and has been is to talk to old timer um, cheese makers, especially cheddar makers. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, we used to have thousands of cheese factories in Greene County alone. A um, hundred years ago, there were over 200 cheese factories. And for the very simple reason, there was a cheese factory every four to four and a half miles. And that was because that was the farthest difference distance. A farmer was willing to haul his milk with a wagon and horses with milks and cans, milk and cans to the cheese factory. That, that was just the longest that like uh, for two miles, a, a, a horse and a wagon and a farmer were willing to go. Um, but the difference, why I say that is because cheddar and everybody was making cheddar back then, it tasted different at every factory. And um, old time cheesemakers will tell you, oh, I, I, remember, I remember Cedar Grove's cheese uh, cheddar. And I remember so-and-so's cheddar. And cheddar makers tended to work together. Like um, back then there were no commercial cultures. Now you, you, there are culture houses. So you, you purchase a, cult, a starter culture and you, you mix it with a little bit of water and you put it in your milk and it starts to coagulate your curd. Back then everyone was making their cultures like think a sourdough start, starter. So sometimes your culture would die, right? You'd, you'd have a whole vat of milk and it wasn't coagulating. So then you got um, on your horse or in your wagon and you drove four miles to the next cheese factory and you're like, hey, can I borrow some of your starter culture? And if they liked you, they said, sure. And if they didn't, you drove another four miles to the next cheese factory. Um, just, it's very, it's very, it's always very interesting to me about how um, cheddar tastes different. So, so tonight, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna eat some cheese. Um, so we're going to, obviously we're going to start with the one-year cheddar, right? And so, um, this is the one-year cheddar. It's this, it's this fluorescent orange. Uh, Tony Hook makes some of the most fluorescent orange cheddar there is. He adds extra annatto. He wants you to know it's from Wisconsin. Um, there's lots of theories about why Wisconsin cheddar is orange. Um, the, the best one that I have heard over the years is that it differentiated putting annatto in Wisconsin cheddar differentiated the Wisconsin cheddar from the New York cheddar on the on the old Green Bay um, um, cheddar exchange, which is now the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the CME. Um, buyers were willing to pay more for Wisconsin cheddar because um, they thought it tasted better, which goes back to the cows and the dirt and the grass, which we'll talk a little bit. And so cheesemakers started um, capitalizing on that and putting coloring annatto in their cheddar so that buyers knew it was from Wisconsin. Um, so the way that I taste cheese is that I'm, I always break it in half. I, 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 like, I like to see how much it bends. There is a way to actually judge cheese. Um, fun fact, I went through many courses at the Center for Dairy Research to become a cheese judge. And I passed all of the tests until I got to the bitter test. And then I realized of the 24 um, at panels of bitter, there's 24 different bitter um, profiles that you can taste. I can't taste 17 of them. I'm considered bitter blind. One of the most depressing days of my life. So I never got to be an official cheese judge, but I learned how to do it. So basically you want, you want to bend your cheese to see the flexibility. And this is telling you like 
it didn't it didn't break to the end. This tells you a lot about the age of your cheese. Basically, the more that it bends, the younger it is. Um, this this is like got the perfect break point for about a one year cheese. Okay, and then you're gonna want to smell it. And even though that I we cut these pieces yesterday, and they've been on a plate, you should still you should still get that dairy that dairy aroma, right? It should smell like cheese, basically. Um, and it smell it should smell clean. And when I say clean, like there should be no ammonia. Um, you can, I mean, to me, I can't taste bitter, but I can almost smell the the defects that cause that. And this so this is a really nice clean piece of cheese. Um, th there's nothing special about this piece of one year cheddar you got. I I cut it, I sliced it off the five or the five pound loaves that we use in the Firefly. Um, so some of you may have a piece with a little bit of calcium lactate, some little bit of white on the rind that is not mold. Um, and some of you may have a lot more of it on your piece of 20 or some of you might not have any. It kind of depends whether you got an edge piece or a middle piece. Um, and be, by the way, start eating your cheese. I can't eat and talk at the same time. So now I'm gonna hand this to Uriah and he's gonna eat it. <laughs> Hopefully he'll do it quietly so you don't hear him chewing. Um, but the calcium lactate uh, crystals are something that is um, special for cheddar. If you have, if you find like other, especially hard Italian cheeses, Parmesan, um, Asiago, um, there will be like crystals. You'll you'll taste crystals on those cheese. Um, those, those are different. Those are um, tyrosine crystals. It's a it's a component of cheese aging. Cheddar has its own aging process with calcium lactate, and um, it usually in a young cheese cheddar like this, it happens on the surface because that's where the water activity is kind of happening as the cheese is aging. There's the water is kind of like trying to leach out of the cheese. And so it, it might be pooling a little and then the calcium lactate crystals are growing on that. So in a young cheddar, you might see it only on the surface. On the 20 year cheddar, which we'll taste here in a minute um, and you can look at it, you should, to the naked, it's a little dark in here, but to the naked eye, you should see like little like pinpricks um, of spots in your cheddar. And those, that means that the, the calcium lactate crystals have basically morphed into the center of the cheese. And that's a sign of a really old cheddar. Um, it's, it's hard to find calcium lactate crystals in the aged cheddar anymore because you have to age a cheddar out a very long time. The last thing I'll say about cheese crystals is that um, there's a lot of cheese on the market right now that um, has crystals in it. Like if you've ever had one of our Deer Creek Bat 17, if you've ever had Sartori Bella Vitano, any of those lines of cheeses, um, gosh, there's a ton of them that when you eat them, they taste, you can tell, you, they taste aged and kind of crystally. Um, that is from um, an adjunct culture, starter culture that's added to the milk. And that, that starter culture was um, discovered and developed and um, helped marketed by the Center for Dairy Research at UW-Madison. And that was about six years ago. It's called Lactobacillus, Lactobacillus Helveticus. Um, and that has become super popular. So um, the days of being able to tell how old the cheese is by how many crystals it has is like over. <laughs> because now there's a starter culture that you can add to the other starter culture to make your cheese um, age faster and gain more flavor. And there's nothing wrong with that. Again, I just find that fascinating that um, the Center for Dairy Research was able to um, pinpoint that culture. Um, so one of the things that you'll find about Hooks cheddars is that, that for a one-year cheddar, that's pretty creamy, right? Um, you may have had other aged cheddars that are more crumbly, um, more bitter, more acid. Um, and Tony has a specific make process. He also ages all of his cheddar. He makes he only makes 40 pound blocks. He does not make any wheels. It's all 40 pound blocks. And as soon as that 40 pound block is off of the press, it is wrapped and sealed in oxygen-free plastic, which in the industry is called cryvac. So it's cryvac. Um, I would say that in general, I've always considered cryvac to be bad <laughs> because what it does is it starves the cheese of oxygen and doesn't let it age naturally. However, 
if you are trying to get a 40 pound block of cheese to age to 20 years, those flaws now become features because you want it, you don't want it to age naturally. You want it to age super slowly um, and you want it to get as much age as you can. Um, by the way, the way Tony Hook, probably Tony Hook and Sid Cook are the, maybe Bob Wills, and these guys will tell you this. There's a handful of cheesemakers in the state of Wisconsin that can taste a block of cheese, especially cheddar, and tell you how close it is to peaking and how much longer they can age it before they have to sell it. So it's not like a cheesemaker makes a vat of cheese and says, this is gonna be five-year cheddar. A cheesemaker makes an old fashioned cheddar maker like Tony Hook, Sid Cook's doing this, makes every vat of cheddar to age as long as possible. And then they're put into cryovac um, or wax. Sid Cook is making a lot of waxed big wheels of cheddar. And then they're put into cold storage. Um, uh, cheddar cold storage is colder than a typical. I mean, it, it's probably like 45 degrees in there. It's chilly. Um, and then they're saving one block or one wheel as their tester wheel. Um, Tony, I think it depends on how old the cheese is, but um, he's aging, He's using a cheese trier going into that block of cheddar, twisting it, bringing out like a, um, a little stick and tasting it. And he's able to be like, okay, this cheese is peaking, got to sell it. This cheese is now two-year cheddar going on the market. Or, or he's like, oh, this cheese has got a long ways to go, seals, seals the thing, puts a mark on that pallet or however much cheese he's made and says, good to go for another six months. Um, so I always found that I did not realize that until I spent time with cheesemakers that I thought, oh, today they're making three-year cheddar. <laughs> no, every day they're making 20-year cheddar, but not every vat makes it that long. Um, and that's not because of anything that, that perhaps might be in the cheesemaker's control. And I'll talk about that a little bit right now. Um, different seasons bring different milk. Um, so in the state of Wisconsin, we still have about 35% of our cows, our dairy cows are on pasture, even though we have winter here in the state. Um, and California, you know, remember those, those irritating happy cow ads that used to just super annoy me? I've been to California, you, you show me a, a California cow on grass, I'll just say that. Um, but in Wisconsin, about 35 to almost 40% of all the cows, millions of dairy cows are still on grass. They're either, um, they're on pastures that are intentionally, intentionally rotationally grazed, um, or they're smaller dairy farms which are still turning their cows out to pastures. Tony Hook has had the same, he, has, he buys milk from four dairy farms. So when you think of uh, big cheesemakers, Tony Hook is not a big cheesemaker. Apparently there was a guy that came in today and was giving my staff a hard time saying that, oh, the whole Hook's aged cheddar is just a myth. He just buys cheddar and puts his name on it. I'm like, what? No, he's, he's buying milk from four farmers. Like I can, do you want me to drive you to the farms, dude? You know, um, and those four farms are now in their second generations all four of those farms pasture their cows. So they intentionally rotationally graze. So the, the cows are moved to a different pasture every 12 hours. And what that does, grass fed milk gives you a different um, flavor component, um, a different science of cheddar. And it's specifically good for cheddar cheese. Um, Tony will tell you that his age, like both of his 20 year cheddars um, have both been made in October. Which, are, which sort of negates my whole previous talk, right? Like you would think it'd be a summer when the grasses are lush. Um, grasses are lush in the spring and in the fall. In summer, they tend to get, to get, um, they tend to get burned up, more brittle. There's less nutrients in them. Um, in October, cows are still out on like, on like newer grasses coming back, but more importantly, you're supplementing their feed with fresh hay and when you have a dairy cow, you are feeding them either hay that you've made yourself or you've purchased, and you're, you're, you're um, feeding them only the very best high quality alfalfa or a clover mix or a brome grass mix hay, because that's what produces the most milk. And if you're a dairy farmer, how do you make money? Your cows produce more milk. Um, so he has found that that fall milk provides the perfect um, recipe for cheddars that age 
the longest, um, which I just found, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm one of those weird science people, I find that fascinating. And so um, I'll tell you just a little bit about, um, you'll, you'll find that there are, the cheddar makers in Wisconsin are sort of clustered in these three parts of the state. We have cheddar makers in the Driftless region, which is that southwest portion of the state where that was not glaciated the last um, ice age. And then we have some cheddar makers like in the Fox Valley region. And then there's a couple like in Mar a few in Marathon County. And so the dairy farms have congregated in those parts of the state because of dirt. Um, those parts of the state have the best dirt for growing grass. Um, believe it or not, and many of you may know this, I didn't know this until I delved into it many years ago, um, there are certain types of dirt that grow better grass than others. Um, and uh, in the driftless region, the, so the soils are like absolutely ancient because you gotta remember the last ice age never touched the driftless region. Um, so the soils, and I have this right next, I can't remember all this, but the soils in the driftless region, region are dominated by red clays um, and absolutely thousands of years of prairie roots. Um, so these have de decomposed into this thick, rich mass, and they carry the soil type names such as Fayette and Dubuque. Um, there's a very well-known cheese factory in Fayette, Wisconsin, which is um, in unincorporated called Brunkow cheese. You may have heard of it. Um, Fayette got its name from some Fayette soil, and obviously you all know Dubuque, Iowa, and Dubuque, Iowa is in the Driftless, the Driftless region. So if you compare that to like the eastern part of the state, which is glaciated fat, the so so the soils in like the, the driftless part of the region are millions of years old. The soils in the eastern part of the state are 10,000 years old. Um, it, and it makes a difference in the science, the pH, the chemistry um, of, of the soil. Um, and if, you, if you've never talked to a farmer and I ask a lot of people where their milk or their cheese comes from and they say the store, right? So it, to me, it's, it, it's worth bearing out to remember that cheese comes from milk and milk comes from a cow. I know that seems very like elementary, but we, all of us are so removed from agriculture that we forget that. And milk comes from grass. So um, I created this huge campaign for the Department of Ag back in the early 2000s that it, it was, I don't know, it was catchy then, it's kind of lame now, but like, if like basically have, have patience in time, grass becomes milk. Um, and we did a whole campaign on grass-based cheese, grass-based dairy, because back then that wasn't a thing. <laughs> People are like, what are you talking about grass-based cheese? It was cheese makers who were making cheese only from milk that was coming from cows that were on grass. Um, so, so the fact that Tony Hook is only buying milk from farmers who are pasturing their, their cows um, tells me a lot about why he's able to age his cheese out as long as he is. Um, and obviously in Wisconsin, we have winter. Cows do not go on grass in the winter, they eat hay. But you have to remember that the hay that they're eating is dried grass and alfalfa that was usually harvested on that same farm. So it's a dried version. Um, most, uh, dairy farmers, you'll see fewer dairy farmers um, feeding their cows silage that are selling their milk to an artisan or specialty cheese maker because silage um, has natural gas in it. And then that gas gets um, passed to the milk, which then gets passed to the cheese. And so it's very hard to age cheese from milk that was made by a cow that's eaten silage because it literally blows up. It get, it's called gassing up. Um, it develops holes in it and defects. Um, so your eyes looking at me like stop talking about geeky science. But anyway, I just find it very exciting. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna try the the twenty year um, cheddar. Um, okay, so I'm like totally off my notes now. I'm just gonna pass this onto here. Um, I should say and this is the last thing I have written down um, that. Um, Tony um, is very open about, he has a team of people. He and his wife, Julie, made cheese together. The, it was just the two of them for years and years and years. They are about, both now, like the rest of us, getting older. He has brought on um, a few nieces and nephews, and his sister, Julie, is also helping um, in the make room. So um, it's nice to see that the Hook 
family is going to continue on and we will have more more folks cheese. Um, so if you if you have the 20 year, if you haven't eaten it, if you remember to pick it up, if all the stars have aligned. Now, okay, so now is, and now is the time to smell it. So um, sadly, I have tasted and smelled enough cheese that to me, this, this smells completely different. I don't know if it will to you, um, but um, it smells completely different to me. The piece that I also have has this white on the rind. Um, some of you are gonna have a lot more, these, remember these are the calcium lactate crystals. Some of you are gonna have a lot more than others. You should, you should view that those as a feature and not as a flaw because it's going to add texture to your mouth. Um, at, when I was working at Metcalf's, we bought um, Tony's 10-year cheddar. Just, it was like a standard cheese in our cheese case. And we bought it in five pound loaves and then we cut it and we, and we sold it. And I had customers who would always ask for me to save the ends of those 10-year loaves because it, it was just completely lined with the calcium lactate and they liked that crunch in their mouth. Um, so again, so you're eating this cheese. So let's let's so let's break this cheese. This cheese, if it was made by anybody other than Tony Hook, like it would be falling apart as I held it. Like it would be breaking as I held it. But because Tony Hook is so amazing, this cheese still has. Look, I I was able to bend it to there, elect elasticity until it breaks. And this this piece of cheese is 20 years old. So I would go ahead and smell the piece that you broke off and then obviously eat them. Um, when Uriah and I were cutting this, I, by the way, I, I've had, so I've had this 20 year cheddar for eight or nine months before COVID. Um, Tony Hook was gonna do a huge event at the Firefly for me. He was gonna come, we were gonna do a tasting. It was gonna be amazing. And then of course, pandemic. Um, so this cheese is actually 21 years old. <laughs> um, and so I was a little before, obviously we did this. Um, I had faith that it would still be good, but when your eye and I were cutting it and I tasted it, I can't remember, I can't taste the 17 of those 24 components of bitter. And all I was getting in my mouth was acid. I was like, oh my God, your eye tastes this, is this bitter? And he was like, no, it's not bitter, it's fine. You are gonna, you're probably thinking this is really sharp. So what sharp is, is sharp as acid. The acid level in this cheese is higher because it's had so much time to age and develop. So in your mind, think sharp equals acid. Um, the sharper a cheese, what you're actually tasting is that acid level. And I can taste acid. It kind of like, it's gonna bubble like at the back of your tongue. Um, it's gonna be kind of hard to get that taste out of your mouth. Like you might have to take a drink of water or a cracker because it's going to linger. It's going to like stay there. Um, but that um, that is that is a feature of, of cheddar. You want you want to be able to taste that acid. Um, Tony, I've done um, a whole tasting array with Tony and, and done classes with him where I've asked him what his favorite um, age of cheddar is. And he will tell you three years. I'm like, three three years is your favorite. I mean, like you make this for a living. And he, he says that three years, the acid, acid comes and goes like it, there's hills and valleys to it. And at three years, three years, he says, it's so smooth. It's like, it's like drinking like a, like a 20 year scotch. Like, you know, the acid is there, but you can't really taste it. And it's just nice and smooth. By the time a cheese gets to five years, especially seven years, the acid is coming back. Um, and so to me, I can taste it, but it's not overwhelming. Um, so do you, do you all like the cheese? Was it, um, <laughs> hopefully it was, yeah, hopefully it's uh, not uh, anti-climatic for you. Um, so that's kind of like the end of my talk. I see we have some yeah. questions. Yeah, so Karen. We, we have some questions. Yeah. So um, Nancy asked, I noticed the cheese makers we're, we're using bare gloves, why oh. no gloves? Or bare hands, why no yeah. gloves? So um, so when you are making cheese, in this day and age, um, the FDA is encouraging, requiring cheesemakers to wear gloves and cheesemakers hate it um, because um, gloves breed bacteria. The longer you wear them, the more bacteria that's going to live inside of them, on them. Even when we're making food here at the Firefly, we are changing our gloves 
like every two to three sandwiches we make, we're changing them because you know what happens when you wear gloves? You touch your face. Um, you got an itch in your head. You do that. You touch, you touch a piece of equipment. Cheesemakers are so used to washing their hands um, 75 to 100 times a day that wearing gloves, they don't feel like they make as clean of cheese wearing gloves because it does not encourage them or their employees to ever wash their hands. Um, so I myself would rather eat cheese that's been made with bare hands because I know that cheesemaker. So before a cheesemaker ever starts getting his hands in the vat, um, they have a dedicated hand washing sink and they wash their hands like think of a surgeon like you've seen a surgeon on TV. They're scrubbing up, they're soaping up their elbows. Um, they're rinsing off without touching the hand handles. It's usually a hand, it's controlled by a foot, a foot pedal. And then they're walking to the vat like this. And every time they put their hands in the milk, they're going through that procedure. Um, so yeah, so that's the question that answer to that. And then another question, question what happens to the whey? Oh, um, so what happens to the whey is that small cheese makers capture that in, um, um, in whey tanks. And then the local farmers will come and get it and feed it to their livestock. Um, there's not many pigs, hogs left in the state of Wisconsin. That industry has mostly consolidated to, uh, to Iowa and the central Midwest. Um, hogs love whey. Um, it's like, it makes a really nice slop. Um, you used to see um, dairy farmers um, feeding the whey to cows and mixing it in a total mixed ration. Um, however, that practice has pretty much been stopped because um, it was it was forcing abortions in the cows. Um, something in that way was it, it's not a natural thing for a cow to consume, so they were losing their calves. Um, but most of it is um, is, got, is is frankly spread on fields as as a natural fertilizer. Um, on the farm that I grew up, I grew up on I grew up outside of Belmont, which is home to two major cheese factories, Lactalis which makes um, the brie and also Montchev, which makes the goat cheese. And so my dad had a contract with um, one or both, it, and depending on the year, that the whey trucks would come and spread the whey on the pastures. Um, it's a natural fertilizer. Um, and after about three days, um, you can't, you can't, the cows can't smell or taste that whey. It's into the soil enough to, um, to act as a natural fertilizer. Um, and the big, the big cheese makers, like the guys making 640 pound blocks are selling their whey on the open market and it's being turned into whey protein powder. So there's a really big whey protein powder plant in Reedsburg, Wisconsin called Terra's Whey. Um, they are selling a lot of whey protein powder. And there, when you are selling cheese on the commodity market, <laughs> there are days or weeks that you're, you're making more money from the whey that you sell for whey protein powder than the commodity 640 pound block cheddar, which is another reason to just not make commodity cheese. <laughs> if you're making more money on the waste product, then there's something wrong with the industry. Yeah. All right, and another question, is there a beverage you recommend to eat with cheddar or cheese in general? Oh, so um, so cheddars are aged cheddars are big bold flavors. So you want to pair something that's big and bold. So if you're a wine drinker, I I put a cab a cabernet with it. Um, your eye, what are you drinking? Is how is that going with your? He's, your eye's drinking a New Glarus Cabin Fever. How's that pairing? Uh, good. He says good, but then again, I think he would say that any beer any beer <laughs> pairs well with twenty year cheddar. Um, Really, you, you want to think about the cheese on your plate and think about the flavor, the flavor level. So if they're mild cheeses, pick a beer or a wine that's milder. If it's if they're more bolder flavors, pick something that's more bold. That, that's a really super easy way to do it. If you want to get more into it, you can start drinking wines from the region that your that your cheese was made in. You can do a whole terrar pairing. We've done those. Those are really fun. Um, yeah, but basically try to match the level of flavor that you're consuming. So one doesn't overpower the other. All right, and another question is, how do the cheeses aged chemically compare 
um, and vary in taste to the naturally aged cheeses? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So like, so if you think of Pleasant Ridge Reserve, um, which is a naturally rinded cheese, one of the most famous cheeses in the nation, it's made 30 miles south of here. Um, it's made with grass-based uh, milk and it's made in wheels and it's washed in, um, in a brine and allowed to age naturally with a rind. Um, the key difference is that um, controlling a rind on a cheese is labor intensive. So at, at Uplands Cheese where they're making Pleasant Ridge Reserve, Andy Hatch has got two full-time guys whose entire job every day is to wash cheese, wash and scrub cheese. So if you ever wonder why cheeses like Pleasant Ridge Reserve cost $25 a pound, it's because of the labor component. Um, they're much harder, much um, more labor intensive to keep that rind natural. They also don't age out as long because you are living, you're working with a living, breathing mold on that cheese um, and mold has a shelf life. Um, good mold or bad mold, it has a shelf life, right? And so the oldest Pleasant Ridge Reserve that I've eaten that was like really good was like two and a half years old. Um, beyond that, I mean, even like, even like Parmesan, Parmesan Reggiano in Italy, that's, that's a natural rinded cheese. And if you get one much beyond three years, it's like dry and chalky and not worth the price that you paid for it. Um, so cheeses that are aged in plastic and cryovac are made to age for longer periods. Um, and it can, it's, it's easier to control the aging of that. So a question that just came in, um, I'll go back and get other questions. Uh, what happens to cheese if you age it longer than you should? Does it mold <laughs> or just doesn't taste good? Or um, so Yeah, so cheese, cheese always molds. So if you have cheese in your fridge for weeks on end and it's not molding, be afraid. Um, I <laughs> like cheese, if, it, if it's not molding, there's some preservatives in that cheese. Um, and it should be molding and all you do is you cut off that mold like a quarter inch below the mold and you throw that away and then you keep eating the cheese. Um, but cheese that's older than it should be is gonna start having defects. If it's a soft cheese, it's gonna become ammoniated. So like if you've ever had a brie and you open it up and you get like this, this whiff or like maybe it's an ammonia bomb, um, it means that the cheese, the paste has aged to the level where it can no longer absorb that national that natural ammonia and it's giving it off. Um, and so it's gonna taste off. It's, it's um, anytime like a cheese tastes metallic, um, like, I don't know, like dirty or more earthy, um, bitter, I can't taste much bitter, but bitter is generally a defect and a, a sign that the, the cheese has been aged longer. Um, it used to be, Flavored cheeses are so popular right now. I have a lot of flavored cheeses in my case. I never thought I would, but the American consumer is demanding flavors in their cheeses. But 20 years ago, a cheesemaker added flavor, added peppers or pesto or whatever to a cheese to cover up a defect in the cheese. And so 20 years ago, if you're eating a flavored cheese, you were eating a cheese that the cheesemaker was basically trying to sell because the milk, he'd had to hold the milk longer than he should have, or somehow during the, the make process, maybe the phone rang and he didn't get the, the, cheat, the, the curd cut on time. So, hey, let's add a bag of peppers and no one will notice. I'm not making this up, this stuff happens. Um, but now the American consumer is demanding such bigger, bolder flavors. We have a cheese in our case right now called Rattlesnake, Deer Creek Rattlesnake. It's infused with tequila and habanero peppers and it's so uh, and it's spicy it's hot and it's made on purpose <laughs> that way um yeah it's it's interesting how things evolve so we have a pairing suggestion uh new glarus apple ale goes well with the 20 year cheddar oh i can totally see that because apples and cheddar are a very natural pairing nice job Excellent. Uh, so then this one goes back to the question about beverages. Um, and I don't know much about the acid in wine, but this is the question. Would a higher acid aged cheese pair well with a high acid wine or would they be better with low acid wines? I, okay. I don't know much about wine. 
So I'm not a sommelier. I only know cheese. <laughs> um, and if I, whenever I have taught a class with wine, I bring a sommelier with me. <laughs> and so I don't know the difference between a low acid and a high acid wine. Very, very sorry. Okay. Uh, my suggestion would be to try them both and see which one tastes better. <laughs> I can endorse that. Okay. Um, next question. Does a chef using 20 year old cheese in cooking or is it served on its own merits, a cheese board or how is it used? Well, um, <laughs> so first of all, a chef, not, is, a chef is not using a 20 year cheddar <laughs> because it costs $209 a pound. Um, in 2015, um, uh, Tori Miller at uh, Le Toile, um purchased some cheese, some 20 year cheddar from Tony Hook, and he had a special 20 year cheddar dinner. Um, I was gonna, I don't know if Dean is on this call, but Dean, if you're on the former cheese um, monger with me at Metcalf's, I had this photo of you, me, and Justin at that 20 year dinner at Le Toile where we were like, we were very dressed, very fancy, and it was a big deal because, you know, we're all poor. Um, and, <laughs> and we're sitting at Le Chual eating this dinner made of 20 year cheddar. Um, but that is like, that is very rare. Um, a oh, and your eyes like, here I goes, how much were those tickets? <laughs> they were like $300 a person for that dinner. Um, yes. So your eye remembers how much things cost. <laughs> But no, the answer is that basically how you eat a 20 year cheddar is A, you have to find it. Um, and then B, you eat it very slowly by itself and you savor it because it, it there, this is probably some of the last of the hooks 20 year cheddar that's in existence. And I, I, and I only have it because I've been trying to figure out a worthy thing to do with it. Um, and as, as many of you know, I'm a huge fan and supporter of the Oregon Public Library. Here's my, here's my political plug. We're trying to build a new library in the village of Oregon, and I've been very um, a, a vocal um, proponent of that. I'm on um, one of the honorary chairs of the fundraising committee. And so I really want to charge you all for this class, but Kara said I couldn't because public libraries don't do that. They are a service to everyone, and it's equal opportunity to everyone. So then I counted up how much cheese I had, and I had had 75 servings. So that's why we have 75 people. Um, and I do have, um, we're gonna sell, I think 15 special cheese boards tomorrow because I had enough um, 20 or cheddar left to like kind of do a special cheese board at the Firefly tomorrow that we're gonna sell. So so if you if you have friends that missed out on it tonight, I think we have 15 cheese boards tomorrow. Uh, and then we just have one more question that came in. Um, cheddar is big in Wisconsin. Is Limburger unique to Wisconsin also? Cool. So there's only one cheese factory left in the state of Wisconsin making Limburger. And the, um, that is um, Chalet Cheese Cooperative near Monroe. Um, and, it, and it's not because um, people, cheesemakers don't know how to make Limburger. It's because that there is very little demand <laughs> for Limburger. Um, Limburger was always traditionally the working man's cheese. It was inexpensive. Um, it was the cheese that people that blue collar workers bought um, and ate for sandwiches when they were working. Um, I remember uh, my dad talking about how his dad had a brick of Limburger that was in um, a mason jar that sat on the counter with a lid on it. Um, and he would use that for sandwiches. Ugh. That does not sound good to me, um, but there's just, there's not, so here's the funny part of that. So there's not a huge demand for Limburger anymore because it carries the name Limburger and people associate that with stinky, smelly socks, gross, don't like it. But right now I have this super small batch, limited cheese in my case from Bruton, Minnesota called North Fork Whiskey Washed Munster, which is based on the Alsatian Munster from France. So this cheese is like this big around. It's super moldy, it's wrinkly, it's beautiful. It tastes a lot like Limburger, but it's a small batch, highly prized award. It just won a 2021 National Good Food Award because, because it's called North Fork Whiskey Washed Munster and it's round. <laughs> It's the same style of cheese as Limburger, but Limburger, I, I mean, I don't say it has, it's such a bad reputation and it shouldn't because it's a good cheese. 
but yeah, there's only one cheese plant left in Wisconsin making it. All right, any, anything else, Kara? Um, there were some questions about uh, making donations to the library and I will send oh. out information about that. Okay. Um, this presentation was also recorded and I'll send the link out later this week. Um, if anybody has any other questions, um, put them in the chat. Let's see if anything comes in. Yeah. A lot of people just really loved the cheese and loved being able to hear more about it. Um, so yeah, I, I think I will say I'll, <clears throat> I'll close with uh, at, at Firefly, we, um, we have adapted um, our staff to we, we very much hire professional baristas. So I hire people who have a passion for coffee and food with um, that have a longevity working for us, right? So the majority of the people working for us, like we hired three years ago when we took over and they're still working for us, right? Um, but not everybody wants to do that. There, there's always some part-time people who want a part-time job. So right now I've got two part-time gals working for me. They're, they're going to college. Um, one is 19 and her name is Josie. And so we're cutting this cheese. I said, Josie, do you want to eat a piece of cheese that's older than you are? And her reaction was, that sounds disgusting. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? I am like, do you know how much, like I, like I gave her like one, I'm like, do you know how much is, this is worth? And she's like, so I pretty much guilted her into tasting it and she tasted it. And her response was, well, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. <laughs> so, um, so like coffee, like good wine, uh, good cheese is very much, um, you have to train your palate to appreciate it. Um, and, and I've taught lots of classes where I've had a very expensive, amazing cheese. And there are people who didn't like it because their palate was used to mozzarella. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, one of the reasons I've taught cheese classes for 15 years is um, I'm a big believer. Like you will never see me teach a class where I'm just talking about cheese. I have, over the years, people have hired me to do classes. One of my, um, always one of my um, requirements is people got to eat the cheese while I'm talking. Because you, food is something that you cannot explain, you have to experience. Um, and so I, I like it when people experience the flavors and then I tell the stories of the cheese maker. Um, that's like, that's my favorite. My favorite thing to do is to tell the stories of the cheese makers because in Wisconsin, I got to tell you, we have such an amazing group of men and women, a growing group of women. I remember when I worked for the Department of Ag, I did a press release in 2006. And I was so excited because I was announcing that of the um, 900 licensed cheese makers that we had, we had now added our 40th woman cheese maker. And that was a big deal um, because just cheese making was not seen as a career for women to take. And now, and now in the state of Wisconsin, we have women who are master cheese makers. We have women who have won the world championship cheese contest from the state of Wisconsin. And that just, it, that just makes me proud that um, it's very much seen as, as a, a passion and a career that is open to everyone now. We do have one more question that I accidentally skipped over, so I'll go back to it. Um, okay. Can you find cheese curds in other countries or is it really distinct oh. to the US and or the Midwest in particular? Yeah, so fr fresh cheese curds are pretty much a Wisconsin thing. Um, there are There's a cheese factory called Beecher's Cheese in Oregon that sells them as a novelty. They sell them for $18 a pound because no one knows what they are and they're fresh cheese curds. Um, and then um, there's another, um, a couple factories out east that do them as novelty, but really fresh cheese curds are a Wisconsin thing. Um, and I think that's okay because one of the reasons that we still have 127 cheese factories and that 60 of those are still making cheddar, half of those are also making fresh cheese curds. And when you can sell a cheese that you made on the same day for $6 a pound, Think of the cash flow that that's putting into your business. So now you have cash in the bank to aid those 40 pound blocks of cheddar to five years. Um, cheese, 
the sale of cheese curds in the state is very underestimated as a driver of the dairy industry because um, Bob Wills at Cedar Grove Cheese sells 23,000 pounds of cheese curds a week at $6 a pound. Now he also makes like literally world-class award-winning artisan goat and sheep milk cheeses. Um, but those cheeses take a lot more labor and have to age. And so selling those cheese curds same day that he's making them allows him to make the cheeses that make the, the state famous. Um, and if you've never had a fresh cheese, we used to have fresh cheese curds here on Thursdays. I got them from Cedar Grove Cheese. Like they came from directly from the vat. They'd never been refrigerated. We would bag them ourselves. Cause I just, I'm of the opinion that a cheese curd is not worth the calorie intake unless it's warm and squeaky. Otherwise really just like go eat a burger. Um, but we, st we stopped doing that with the pandemic just cause we don't have as many people coming in the store anymore. But um, hopefully things will get better here with the, the world conditions and we'll go back to having fresh cheese curds cause I miss eating them. <laughs> Mostly I just want them for me. All right, well, we are over time. Again, I want to thank Jeannie so much for donating the cheese and her time for this presentation. Um, thank you all for coming and we'll see y'all later. Bye. Yeah, thank you everybody. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.